probably has some back there. I have some there and I have some over there. And the one question up here was, I saw him taking notes and I'm going, why are you taking so many notes? He goes, I, and he goes, I got to write a report. I got to justify this trip to my boss. And I go, wait a minute, in the back, there's a booklet and, and um, it's called the manufacturing process that actually is about eight or 10 pages that summarizes what this class is about. So if you also have to write a report, it's right there in the back and it's an easy way to submit that uh, to, to everyone. There's a few different ones. There's one on Tablet Pro, one on the manufacturing process. There's uh, uh, one that announces webinars that we've done that you can go and attend and we're offering you to see a free one. Uh, up, just to let you know, there's something interesting that Peter's developed, and you swing that around for a second, Peter. It is a touch screen system. So basically, the information we're giving you here is on a touch screen that can go on the manufacturing floor in your training room where you punch in the training course. It can bring you, say right now we're in blending, it, it can take you to blending and you can do a review of blending theory or and you can incorporate the testing that goes on. So you can take this information and literally plug it in at your plant and deliver the same information. Okay? So a little advertising, hope you don't mind. I just want to make sure that you guys know what we do so you're exposed to it. It's available to you. All right, so let's get on with the show. Um, we're talking about blending. We're kind of partially into blending. Understanding that blending is done in a lot of times in almost similar granulation equipment. What's the difference between blending a powder and granulating? Blending powders is we're trying to create a homogeneity. We're trying to blend powders together and we want to do it uh, and typically it's done in a couple of different ways different types of blenders. Some of those blenders are much like what you're seeing, so we'll talk about that. So we've got different types of blenders for blending of powders, and then we, a lot of times we have a final blender, which is typically a V or a double cone, or a tumble blender or a tote that just is used as a random mixer to blend powders. So when we, when we talked about blending three, five, or 10 minutes, I'm saying that we're blending with a tumble type blender that we'll, we'll show you pictures of. If you're using traditional methodology like a ribbon blender, a plow blender, then your blend times are significantly longer. And a lot of times the percentages are a bit higher because you lose some. Why do we blend? Everybody remember why we blend? To get the tablet out of the dye. So the picture in your book is a picture of an ejection cam on a tablet press. That's a ramp. The ramp on the tablet press is what's pushing the punch up to push the tablet out of the die. Can you see the wear on this cam? Now, when Peter talks about presses, he's going to say something about metal wear. Good metal wear is when metal to metal contacts itself and becomes shiny and more polished. Bad metal wear is when it's rough or abrupt. I don't care what kind of machine it is, what kind of apparatus it is. I don't care if it's your tractor or your riding mower at home. When you have metal to metal contact, good polishing wear is normal when you have metal to metal contact. But if it's abrupt, abrupt like this or rough or discolored, that means there's a lot of friction. There's a lot of force here. And that's not the tooling. That's not the press. That's the fact that there's not the right amount of lubricant to push the tablet out of the dye. That's why we put a powdered lubricant into the blend. The magnesium stearate is a powder. It's a super, super fine powder. Now there are other um, types of lubricants that are used. Sodium lauryl sulfate, there's, I mean, John, steric, can, acid. steric acid is a lube. Mm -hmm. But by far, I would say in the high 90% range as the magnesium stearate is used. Fair statement? Yep. Okay. And so the whole purpose of that is to help get that tablet out of the dye. And how you measure that, one of the metrics is what happens at your machine and what happens on your lower punches on your, on your machine. 
If there's wear on that machine, it's telling you something. And it's not telling your operator didn't know what he did. It's not telling them that the machine's not clean. It's telling them that the powder is non-optimized. So everything that happens on that press can be reported back to some place in that pro granulation process or blend process. So what I said here, type of blender used. That is, in the final blend cycle, I can use a blender to overblend powders. I need to be careful not to overblend, not to uh, underblend. I need to make sure to have the right quantity of powder in the blender. I need to make sure that we have and understand the role of the intensifier bar. And I'll show you pictures of that in just a second. I need to understand my mix time. That a little bit ago, I said there's two ways to measure, basically two ways to achieve a blend. One is to look at the particle and how it's coming together, either through eff effusivity or NIR, or using a, a clock. And a very, very high percentage of people simply time how long they're blending by time. That doesn't always give you the best result. Optimally, you would want to know when everything's perfectly blended, that's when you'd want to stop. The only way you know time works is by through testing and testing and testing. And the message I was giving you was, if you change how much powder is in the blender, you change the particle size, you change the moisture content, you change anything, that changes your blend time. And then we have the final step of lubricating or adding the lubricant within the blend. Okay, so a couple of different types of blenders that are used for, for final blending. Uh, drum blenders, V blenders, double cone blenders, tote blenders. This is a picture of a tote. A tote has two purposes. A tote can be used, it's spectacular use because a tote can be used to transfer product and I can keep it contained. I don't have to transfer it out of the blender, into a tote, over the to, to some kind of device over the press. I can use that tote to go, I can blend in the tote, I can store in the tote, I can put it over the press, I can open that tote and let it go. The downside to a tote is that I have to be very careful with how much product I put in there. It's, if it's a blender, it's not meant to be filled up. It's got to be partially full because you have to have an equal amount of air to the powder to have a, 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 an efficient blend. In other words, if I fill a tote style blender up because it's a good storage device and I'm going to use it as a blender, I just took away my blending capability by overfilling it. So it's a, this particular apparatus that you see inside here, can you see the tote inside? It's upside down inside this big apparatus and it's kind of a jux, it's called a juxtaposition where it mixes that, moves the powders around. So the tote is locked into that blender and used to blend with. Older style, anybody seen a drum blender? Yeah. And I could not believe it. Yeah. Now, yeah. Like, you want to de-blend it? No? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. This is a big problem. These are, you know, people are doing things, clinical batches, things along that line. You know what? Uh, a random blender is a random blender. You know, at a drum, um, is it going to give you efficiencies? The only way you can... You don't get any cross. I mean, you. I used to deal with companies that made swimming pool tablets a lot. And swimming pool tablets are big chlorine or bromide tablets, and they're usually one inch, two inch, or three inch. Could you imagine running a tablet press, making a three inch tablet? It's not an oral contra not, not an oral dosage form. It's a. Um, so anyway, the big round chlorine tablets. The problem with putting lubricant into the blend is when you put those tablets into your swimming pool, it would leave a ring around the hot tub or around the swimming pool. So they don't want the lubricant blended in. So a lot of those guys actually have a device that sprays the lubricant onto the surface of the punches so we can minimize the amount of lube. 
and then compress it. But if they didn't have that, they used to use a drum. And they'd take a drum and they'd take a pipe full of magnesium stearate and they'd put the pipe in and then pull it out. So they literally buried the magnesium inside all the powder and then tumble that and try to make tablets. A complete nightmare. <laughs> but it's very common. Okay. Yeah, I, yes, you, yes, you do. Yes, you do. They can be good. You have to have a very mobile granulation, one that flows very well. It can't be a... Order addition is everything, and, and, and not having one small, minuscule ingredient that you've got to distribute throughout the blend, you'll never achieve it. You, you, you need to have more equal distribution of powders. Fair statement, Peter? Yes, say yes. Say yes. Just okay. say yes. <laughs> now, I mean, the application I used it for uh, was for, like, premixes, oh. right? It's not, it's not the final blend but it's premixes, but they're, they're very common in the industry to be used for that. Yeah, well, that's a little different. Yeah, I'm, for me, blending is blending if I do final or pre-blend or, so they're, they're commonly used. You're insinuating that premix doesn't need content uniformity. Oh, it does, it does. So they're, they're doing a good job. Right, correct, yeah. correct, right. Where your other blenders can fill up a lot more. A bit more. At most. 70 at most. That's a good number. 80. We're, we're just about to get to that. I go for 80. You go. I don't go for 80. Well, okay. I actually use 80. Okay. So on, on, a, on a bowler. I, I mean, think bowler John. Says, John said it best. He said uh, yeah. uh, that that um, it there's always an exception to the rule. That's right. Every time I say you can't do this, somebody's going to go. We do it. So there's always an exception. So there's a general rule about how much powder goes into a blender. And it's between 50 and 70 percent, typically. Now, interesting problem I had talking about how much goes in the blender. We've been doing the same product for years and years and years, and we had about uh, 65, 70 percent volume in the blender. And I know most of you guys have a purchasing department. They buy the raw materials. We had the same thing, so they found somebody cheaper. Uh, same description, looks the same, everything is the same. They didn't tell us. So my operator came to me and said, it don't fit in the blender. I'm going like, what are you, what are you talking about? Why well, can't get it in the blender? It doesn't fit all. I said, you guys made a, uh, made a mistake in weighing or whatever you did. You did something wrong there. No, we didn't. We checked everything. Long story short, what happened was that the density of the new raw material was totally different. And suddenly, it does not fit in the blender. Now, that was an extreme, and luckily it was. What happened if you a different raw material supplier you're not aware of, and you just have a change where it still fits all in the blender, so you won't be aware that there is a difference. You start blending it, and then you figure out that there's a problem when you come to the next process, either, either encapsulation or compression, and then the guys from there come and say, it don't work. So. No, you don't. I mean, pharmaceutical company, Wait, wait a minute. They Re have, they restate have, that, John. Should, should never. Yeah, they're, I mean, pharmaceutical companies usually are locked into a raw material supplier. They got a change control, so whenever you want to change uh, a raw material, you have to go through the change control process to make sure that it's correct. And it's used uh, in the same way. Should. There's another should. should. Yeah. That, that, would, that would be a must. That is a it's must. not a should word, that's a must word. That is a must word, well, yes. Is that why you made the face? Yes. You must have a change control. She saw, she was watching me. I was having okay. a little personal experience. <laughs> <laughs> but any, anywho, that was, that was my blending experience as far as volume is concerned. Yeah, yeah. So you can have that experience that they come and say it don't fit anymore. <laughs> so when we're looking at these blenders, V blenders, twin shells, you know, what's going on in them, basically the blending's a figure eight. It's kind of blending the material. It's a random mix. It's very dependent. There's nothing in there to impart energy to the powder other than the 